Thanks so much. And thanks so much for having, hosting it at this house. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be presenting about this topic, I pursue ultimate meaning. And I'd like to start with a story. Um, this is Mount Olympus. And the story is a young man who grows up hearing about the gods of Zeus, Athena, Aphrodite, etc. And he decides that he's going to ascend Mount Olympus to ask the gods about the meaning of life. Right? And so he makes a long ascent, um, gets to the top, and finds nothing. Uh, there was nothing there. Um, and uh, you can see this this um, inner impulse or this inner longing for pursuing meaning and uh, trying to figure out answers to big questions like why are we, where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? Um, this is a medieval rendition. Um, this happy little son. Uh, this uh, idea was that you could. If you could push through the stars, you would cross a threshold and you would get to the presence of God. If you could just pass through that ether. Um, and today we've done that, right? We've seen what's there. Uh, and we realize there's no like curtain uh, that you can pass through to get there. We just keep seeing emptiness, right? And to a degree, this is this is awe-inspiring <coughs> how grand it is, right? There's a sense of reverence for just how big the universe is. And on the other hand, it also can be terrifying. I don't know if it's just me, but sometimes I think about that and I think, wow, this, I don't see anything, right? And so it can lead logically to a conclusion like this. Uh, this is from Richard Dawkins. Life has no higher purpose than to perpetuate the survival of DNA, no design, no purpose, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Right, this is a, I, I think it's a pretty logical conclusion when you're looking at the grand, where you're looking at all the emptiness and you can't see. We've tried so many times to, to pinpoint the gods, to find them, and they're elusive yet again, right? Um, so, in this this presentation, I want to, I don't, I can't necessarily refute this, uh, but to kind of bring some tension to this idea. Because if you look at the, this is the history of the Earth. Oops, it's cut off a little bit, but right here is humans, this line right here. Um, the history of the Earth at, mapped to a 24-hour clock. So you can see that um, life began at 4 a.m. in this version. Uh, Single-celled algae was at 2, 2.08 p.m. Land plants didn't get to, there until 9.52 p.m. Right, right so most of us are probably going to bed. Uh, the dinosaurs, 10.56 p.m., and the humans is, uh, let, me, let me read it for you, 11.58 and 43 seconds. So we're kind of right at the very, very end. And so on the way that, that position that Richard Dawkins takes is logical. On the other hand, uh, we've been here for a few seconds. And, and to say that we, we know that there's no purpose, I think... I like to add some tension to that because what if we just went a few seconds longer? Or how about two minutes longer? Or what would we find if we lived, if we existed for another 24 hour cycle in this, this idea? How, how much further would we get? And we might even discover that we are not even asking the right questions at all. We're not even close to asking the right questions. Um, it's, and we can see that not only, not only are humans showing up at the very last second, uh, the Earth's formation, but also just in the past <coughs> few hundred years, there's been this explosion of human population. And so something is very different just right now. And so when we look, when we go back to this idea, we can't say definitively that uh, we know exactly where we're, where we're headed. Um, and so yeah, maybe we can look at filling the void. So when we, what, sometimes when we can look at this again, the stars, we can think, we can be overwhelmed with reverence for the grandeur. And sometimes we, we think, uh, I think, I should put myself in this category, absolutely, uh, that it's so overwhelming that we might uh, start turning toward distraction to the extent that it becomes out of balance, right? So you can see, not, not that any of these things are bad, uh, in themselves, but we're pouring just lots and lots and lots of time into these diversions. And what are the implications of this diversion? 
So this is one thing that uh, I think that religion does well, is that it, it puts us in a position where we ask the questions, the bigger questions. We're not just in the day-to-day -day living, but we, in religion, stop and reflect and think about the deeper meaning of life. And so this is also another, this is, in my opinion, a reason for Oasis as well. To have a place where we can just stop and think, like, well, what is the grand purpose? Um, because we uh, want to, in my opinion, we want to avoid this simple trajectory. Kind of think about, well, where, where are we headed? And how can we shape where we're headed and um, aim higher? Because um, as the ancient philosophers would say, memento mori, right? You've got to remember that time is limited and you can get sucked into diversion and then kind of be filled with regrets for the end of life. Uh, so how do, we, how do we react against that? And this quote from George Bernard Shaw, I think, really points to a, a hint of a solution. So it's, he says, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one. The being thoroughly worn out before you are thrown on the scrap heap, the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little pot of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. All right? So it's kind of hard, a hard line that he's taking. But there's this idea that we don't, we don't necessarily, when we're, when we're at work, grinding in a cubicle, or you know, like grinding through work in a cubicle, or things like this, we don't. I, I should put myself, I don't necessarily think of these things. I focus on like what's the task at hand, right? In my day-to-day -day job. I don't step back and think like, whoa, what's, what what is uh, divine purpose recognized by myself as a mighty one? And so this is one thing that I think that these these organizations can help us do is just give us a moment where we think about that idea of what's a, what we might see as a mighty purpose. And I'd like to take a second here to kind of ask that question. So rather than doing a q and I, I would rather just kind of open it to discussion. And um, because I think that another great purpose of Oasis is community building. Like just getting to know more people in the area. And so I would, I would like us to just get in groups of three-ish maybe a little more or a little less, and maybe talk about this idea, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. Has there been a moment in your life where you've really had clarity on a purpose? Um, and if so, like what, what did you feel like was a mighty purpose that you were being called to, if that's the right language? Um, but so go ahead and just get in groups of three, and talk through a moment in your life where you kind of felt uh, this idea of being used for a mighty purpose. Stuart, want to come on down? And if, go ahead and introduce yourself as well if you have some questions. My name is Stuart. Hi, so we're back together. I'm going to be talking to you guys. I'm going to be talking to you guys. So does anybody have anything that they that they'd like to share a moment we that they found? I guess mighty purpose seems kind of grand. Uh, <laughs> 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 Less than five hours of TV a day. 
you can realize what a waste of time it is. Not that it's, it's okay to watch TV, I'm all for TV, sure. but five hours a day seems to be, you're, you're missing something maybe, because you're yeah. doing so much more. And you, and you feel more fulfilled, you feel better when you're doing stuff. But I, I, I used to volunteer a lot of high school, they always ask the kids, tell me something you're really proud of. No one ever said they're proud of watching five hours of TV, right? <laughs> not once. The things they said they were proud of made them feel good, for things that require effort and sacrifice. Yeah. Always. And that's from teenagers to adults. That's so, that's so good. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, there's a uh, study by, um, his name's hard to pronounce, six, Mahali, Six Cent Mahali, uh, who talked about flow, this idea of flow, and they would record people going throughout the day and talk about when they feel, felt fulfilled. And they found consistently that just passively engaging with media was one of the lowest points. Like over and over and over again. Whereas, like leaning into a challenge, people were like, "Yeah, I feel flow. I feel engaged with life. I feel like I'm really wrestling with it, and I feel proud of And so that was a theme that they found um, through that through that research. Yeah. Um, like um, you guys mentioned, about, when you learning something, you feel like you can't do it. But especially
he would frame education as the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness, rather than uh, getting prepared for a career. And he argued for that. Like, that was one of his goals, was to change the education system to focus on these ideas of truth, beauty, and goodness, rather than the uh, Bertrand Russell, famous um, atheist philosopher, also talked about these ideals. And I'm going to end with a quote from him in just a moment. So, a local person, Stephen Covey, uh, he, he talks about intellectual exercise, spiritual exercise, and social exercise. And if the word so spiritual doesn't raise it with you, you can call it whatever you'd like. Uh, but the idea is that intellectual exercise is learning, reading, writing, and teaching. Spiritual exercise, spending time in nature, expanding spiritual self through meditation, music, art. Uh, social exercise, making social and meaningful connections with others. So each of us have might lean in different directions on these three, and that's perfectly okay. I think that's uh, part of realizing our internal purpose, like our individual purpose, can lean in one of these direct in one of these directions. And intellectual intellectual exercise leads to truth. Spiritual exercise, or whatever you might call it, leads us closer to beauty. Social exercise leads us closer to goodness. So really, one way to think of it very loosely is the head, the heart, and the hands. Uh, so truth is like intellectual <coughs> rigor with the head. Uh, the heart of beauty is like really feeling something, going and meditating in nature and really having a transcendent experience. Or in music, right, where you have these moments that are just full of reverence and they kind of move you to a new a new place. And, and at their highest, they kind of they make you feel a sense of, um, I would say love for humans. You kind of realize this oneness and connection with all of humanity and even beyond humanity. Uh, to everything. Uh, social exercise is kind of on the ground, doing things, uh, actually participating. And this all sounds, it's, it can't sound really nice and vague, butterflies and rainbows, right? Uh, and to, to an extent it is, but um, it's easy to to push an excess into one of these areas. And so, Oh, let me let me shift this over just a little bit. Um, we can go we can go wrong by uh, fixating too much on an ideal to where it spills over into a, a to a vice. And I think this one might be uh, the case with a, a secular community might pursue truth to a fault at times. So if you have truth without beauty or goodness, so if you have truth without beauty is cold, where it's just kind of all calculated. And there might be somebody who comes and says, like, you know what, I know that the ancient god of the Hebrews is totally bogus, and I can prove your religion wrong, and it's, it's intellectually rigorous, um, but there might be moments where it's like, oh, okay, it's not the right time, you know, can you, you that's, that's all good, but you have to be considerate of the timing and of the, where the other person is coming from, especially if when they approach religion, they're doing it more as a spiritual exercise rather than an intellectual exercise. Um, and so it can be cold if, if, if it's without the spiritual exercise. Truth without goodness is ultimately lonely. It's somebody in an ivory tower who's so fixated on being right intellectually that they're not engaged in the community. They're not just willing to go and uh, engage with people who aren't at the same intellectual level that they are. And that can be very lonely. Um, likewise, pursuing truth, beauty without truth or goodness, Beauty without truth is gullible, and this is where, I, in my opinion, like religion can go wrong pretty consistently. Is where it's just like, and, and new age spirituality can can get into this where it's like, no, that's not that's not intellectual truth. It's kind of like, um, and it can be, it can, that can be very damaging. Now, one example that I think of is um, Jonestown, where I mean, it's where. Drinking the Kool Aid comes from that phrase, drinking the Kool Aid, where people got um, enthralled with the charisma and uh, they bought into it so much that they didn't stop and check it intellectually and say, hey, actually, this is, this is pretty bogus. And they end up uh, committing mass suicide because of the goal of ability, really. And then Beauty Without Goodness ends up being selfish. It's like pursuing. Um, meditative states without ever actually bringing that to real life action. That was getting to the homeless shelter or doing something that is really making a difference in people's lives. And finally, pursuing goodness without truth or beauty 
Um, goodness of that beauty is routine and bland. I think this is also another area where religious can go wrong is they get fixated on duty, like doing the checklist of things to do, and they just like do the things, but they don't have any heart to it, right? And so it becomes very empty, very hollow. Uh, and that can be very damaging, I think, to um, our inner selves. Thank goodness of that truth is harmful. It's when you're trying to be well intentioned to follow your organization. But your organization is intellectually rigorous and it ends up hurting people. I, I see this in how religions treat uh, the LGBT community. Uh, they don't know the science sometimes, so it ends up really damaging people, even though they would say that they're acting on goodness. They're trying to follow their religion and it ends up being very hard. Um, so, the, uh, it's, it's one thing to say we should follow ideals and another thing to bring it into practice and realize like any ideal pursued too far spills over into vice. And so it's really this balance. How do we find this balance of the quality of life sitting in the center where we have truth, beauty, yeah. and goodness, um, where we're, where we're uh, checking ourselves every once in a while. And in a moment, in a moment, hopefully like this, where we can just have a structured time to say, Okay, let's check. Let's check in and just make sure that we're really on balance. And so I'll just wrap up right here uh, with this idea of grandeur. Um, we have stories that we tell, we say, like, why are we still, are, I think we're still asking these questions. Why are we here? Where are we going? Um, and I think that, that we do have reason to have hope uh, to find increased answers. We can say, for instance, this is just one Sabbath. Of where did we come from? We came from our ancestors. Going back to the apes, small small animals, rep reptiles, multicellular life, and single cell life. We came from to be poetic, I guess, trees, rivers, soil. Uh, why are we here? To experience life completely in each moment and have all the big things of all. This one, one possibility. I mean, this is not the answer, <laughs> um, but just one way to think of it. Where are we going? Um, and this is from Joseph Campbell. He says that the new mythology, which is these what the ancient religions were doing, even the modern religions, uh, were really coming up with mythologies. But Joseph Campbell said the new mythology to come must be a global mythology. It's got to solve the problem of the group by showing them how to do Right? So this is the new mythology that hopefully we're aiming for as a greater community, is this global global awareness uh, that isn't about my tribe versus your tribe, my religion versus your religion. And finally, where are we going? As we evolve, you know, we can push the, transcend human limitations, maybe acquiring superhuman intelligence and openly farm our grace and compassion, and for narrow explorers that only horizons. Again, this isn't, these aren't the answers to the questions. But they're they're um, ways that, of framing that have kind of helped me not have as much anxiety about the emptiness <laughs> and the void. And so I can have, I can have um, focus on figuring out how to transcend uh, human limitations by, by aiming for truth, beauty, and goodness. Um, these are various ideas, uh, mythologies that are modern mythologies, as hokey as Star Trek and some XP, it is a modern mythology at showing how we can transcend the, the anger of the and focus as all of human beings to push the limit, right? To go where no one has gone before. And there's something really powerful about that notion to transcend those limitations. Um, that's, really, that's really it for, for now. Um, we can wrap up, unless there are any further comments. And so we have three minutes. Um, so, yeah, that's that's all I have for here. Um, I'll just end by saying that it's it's hard to say that you don't have the answers. Um, but for lack of truth, don't. And nevertheless, I think that we can still have these moments where we can reflect on what is our mighty purpose and re recommit to live that mighty purpose and really live out our lives so that they are meaningful, um, so that when it when they end, we can look backwards on us rather than regret. So, so, Lance is fond of asking the speaker resources. What kind of thing would you suggest to for people to explore the subject? But I'm guessing. You're reading things aren't going to 
going to cut it. Probably more action as much as anything here. But what, what would you suggest? Resources? People want to explore and think about this and keep it on their mind. Um, yeah, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of resources that I like. Um, there, these two books are popular. Uh, they're something about, um, but they really stayed with me. The book *Sapiens* by Yuval Harari, and then the follow-up um, *Homo Deus*, which is about transcending human limitations. They're both by Yuval Harari, but they talk about myth and how myth is really what separates humans from other animals. Because we can create a story and immediately change the focus on where we're going as a society, as opposed to something like a bee. A bee, 100,000 years ago, was kind of doing the exact same thing that a bee today is doing. But because humans are storytelling mammals, we can shift our worldview and adapt pretty quickly. And it's really what separates us, is according to his, his view. I like those books. Um, in terms of secular, well, I don't know if you call it secular, but um, beauty, I really like this group called Lower Lights um, that is in Salt Lake, and it's actually having our first program meeting on the 31st. Oh, really? uh -huh. And so it's grown. There were 160 people in the last get-together. It's very, very good for mindfulness and meditation. Um, there, there's a lot more I can keep going. As a group, we wrestled with that question of in-group, out-group. Um, you know, tribal, the tribal mind has an in-group tendency, and, and it often has to have an out-group fight. So I love that one at the end of, we're going to build new mythology. Uh, we've, we've struggled with this a lot. What is that new mythology? We've got to figure that out. What is that new mythology that doesn't have an out-group? They always say, well, if aliens invade, the Earth would come together yeah. as one, yeah. and that would be their in group, out group, and that yeah. would be the connectedness we all pray. But I, so, so for me, the thing that makes that it makes it so I don't have to fight an out group is really that breakdown of truth, beauty, and goodness. Because I don't have to be against somebody who's religious. I can accept them. I can accept what they're doing for them in beauty and goodness. Even if I disagree with some of the truth claims that they make, I can say, but they have these experiences that are really beautiful and in their journey, and I can honor that experience for what it is without having to fight that experience. But if it comes up when we do discuss good things, you know, I'll still engage in that. But I don't have to completely discredit them. I can, you have, I can say, wow, that's really You can see the common ground. Uh, I can see the common ground. That's the whole have some aspect of it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, one thing, too, so I feel like we've done good with true. Have these meetings, a lot of that, and a lot of beauty that comes from them. We've talked about goodness, but we haven't done it as much. We, we really want to get into service. One thing I've noticed on the volunteer sheets is everybody signs up to be in the service team, and we need to get it going. I want to put somebody on the spot. She's over there on her phone. Helen, you had a, a, an event coming up. It was a, a soup uh, kitchen type of thing in Spanish? No, it's actually with Circles, which is okay. a community oh, action that helps families out of poverty. We need okay. to be clean and involved in the Nebo site out of Salem. There are other sites, there's one in Provo, one in American Fork. Um, but they see 30 to 40 people per site every single week. And so they're constantly looking for people to bring a meal in. And then they encourage those who make the meal to stay and visit with those families and get to know their community members. Um, and so I have signed up um, to do dinner on February 8th for the Nebo site. But if there is a desire to be one of the other sites, I would be more than happy to sign up for that. How many people do they need? Is there a minimum or maximum? It's just a matter of what we want to bring in and what, what the meal takes to you know, bring in. And so I have created, if you're not involved in the helpful events, I've created it there, but I can post information in. Yeah, there's this group called Helpful Heathens, and we want to partner with them for our service until we get a service team up and running. That's why I bring this up. Yeah, and so this I've created it. a sign-up sheet, and so a lot of, for this meal, it's really easy. There's really no prep work. It's a normal salad, so it's okay. buy something, or give it to me, and I can okay. take it or whatnot. But we were wondering if there's something how this group could help, so yeah. we'll, we'll talk with you and, and see if... Yeah. And other times, lots to sign up to and, and, and help week. out. So, every week. Every week? Okay. Every week. 
And if anyone is interested in leading up that service team, that's kind of a need we have. And it would be just planning a service activity once a month or once every other month, you know, whatever cadence we, we decide would be, be good. The, the group was originally called Community of Good before we joined Oasis. And everybody wanted to be a service organization. We have had, you know, put it in your terms, people that come out of a religion where it was a duty bound thing and there was a little bit of, of um, PTSD from that. But now I kind of understand it in, in terms of the way you framed it, it's the reason why we do know. It wasn't the beauty. What was it? Which one was that? That was the goodness without beauty. And, and we see that. We see that in the people. And then after a few months or a few years of being out, they go, I want to serve. So we need to do more of that.